I can look forward to whatever the new chapter is going to be. I yeah. don't know what it is. I don't know what it holds, but I know that when I turn the page, somehow there's going to be a whole new thing there for me. And and that's that's great, great fun. And I never want to lose that. I really hope that. Mm. Hey everybody, this is Anthony for a new episode of Your Brothers Podcast. Today my guest is Mr. Mark Pryor. Mark co-founded a software development company when he was 19 years old and he never looked back. Entrepreneur at heart, he bought and sold companies, been a, comp a public company CEO and worked as a C-suite media executive throughout his career. He's also board, a member of the board of the Canada's Art Foundation and a tech company, Facecake Marketing. And the list goes on and on. Mark, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Anthony. So, Mark, today um, we're going to start with, let's go back in time, because usually I do that with my, uh, with my guest. Let's go back to where did you feel like you had the first glimpse of entrepreneurship in your, maybe in your heart, in your mind? So 19 years old is quite a young age for most people. So how did you feel it was the right thing for you to go in business and not in school in a traditional path? It's a really embarrassing story because it started when I was about five years old and, and it's a story that my mother would hate for me to tell. And it was actually my parents who recognized the entrepreneurial spirit before I did. <laughs> so I don't know if you're, you're going to want to keep this on the recording or not. Or if I will you're keep everything. It, There's but... nothing embarrassing here. You can speak whatever you want. I, uh, it's so, open. So when I, it was actually when I was four, we moved into a new neighborhood in Toronto and uh there there were no shower curtains uh, there were no curtains up on the bathroom yet uh for the outside window and so i got to know all the neighborhood boys within the first few days of being there and lined them up on the curb and charged them five cents to watch my mother showering my mother was <laughs> <laughs> my mother was horrified Oh and, my God, uh, such a juicy I got, story. <laughs> I got in such trouble, but my parents knew at that point that I was probably going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> five cents. Wow. Okay. Yeah, five uh, cents. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but you still had to, you still had to go through the normal education system from like elementary school or how was your, I think you had a, quite a unique uh, childhood. So maybe let's cover that a couple of minutes and then we can transition to a bit like teenage years and just a little um, chronology. Yeah, I, uh, so I, I spent uh, part of my youth in, in Toronto, uh, was born there, grew up there for a while, but my parents uh, decided that they wanted to become missionaries. They were very uh, devout uh, Christians and wanted to go off to South America and become missionaries. So we went off to Brazil and uh, uh, spent all my teenage years in Brazil. And so I went to went to school, went to an American school in Brazil, uh, learned Portuguese uh, there as well. Of course, um, we were missionaries. But I came back. I, I uh, yeah, I I got kicked out of school. Uh, it's a, it's a long story. Another one of those embarrassing stories. But I got kicked out of school in uh, grade ten, and had to do Ontario correspondence courses. And at the time correspondence courses there was no online you know this was the 70s and correspondence courses were by mail and so the Ontario government would send me lessons every week and I would have to complete the lessons wow. by hand and send them back they'd get marked it would come back eventually I mean the whole lesson process took about a month in order hmm. to complete or more and so it was this back and forth so it was a very slow and arduous process and it took me a long time to do and as a result, I actually never finished high school. And it wasn't something that I that I talked about for a long, long time because I was really embarrassed about that. And so what I but what I did is when I got back to Canada, I went to uh, I went to a school to learn how to code, uh, you know, software school. And mm -hmm. I did that intensive course for about eight, eight months. And then I took up a job in, in programming and the guy who uh, I was 19 at the time and the guy whose company it was, he just recognized some talent in me. Thank God. Uh, he was amazing. <laughs> and um, he just took me under his wing and mentored me. And, um, you know, I, I ends up, I guess I did have some talent because 
we we started the software company together and then we we grew it and um and things just took off from there so i i never actually went to university which is not something that i i'd recommend to to anybody else it happened to work out well for me yeah. what it meant for me is that i really had to work i think that much harder uh in order to succeed uh because i you know i wanted to prove myself for one thing i wanted to to say to myself and to others that i could actually do this but i so i was driven that way but i also really loved what i was doing i was passionate about it and about uh, building software and and coming up with with solutions you know for businesses at the time and that remained throughout my career um so and you know we can we can go from there yeah yeah, yeah. um that's that's amazing man so when you had you felt like you had this this talent for coding um were there any specific area that you really liked at the beginning you felt if you were doing this the energy was there more than certain aspects of business like what was your forte your biggest strength at the beginning and did it stay um, consistent over time or it really evolved as you went through like 20s and 30s well i um yeah i love i i love coding i loved doing what i was doing i love problem solving Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really one of the attractions, actually, you know, to, and to, to get a machine to do, you know, what you wanted to do. And back then, you know, in the 70s, it was really primitive. I mean, I started on, on doing cards, you know, and nobody knows what those are anymore. But and and, uh, you know, started I, I've seen generations of computers from, you know, working on big mainframes down to microcomputers, down to minis and desktops and, you know handhelds everything um so it's been a real uh, wonderful generation to be able to to be there you know at what was you know very much close to the beginning of of computers you know coming into their power and and uh really helping the problem solve in 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 just about anything so that was great but what i found is that i i really had a passion for for people as well mm. and and i really loved the business aspect of what I was doing. And so um, we started, you know, we started growing the business and somebody really needed to manage the business and to, to recruit people and to, uh, to be able to motivate them as well and manage them. And that's one of the things that I, I really, um, I really went toward uh, much more than, than anything else. So I, after a while, I, I actually stopped coding, and and you know, although we had a you know a company that was doing that, uh, and you know that was our function, and then uh, things evolved over time because we were going into various different industries. But the one industry that I really uh, I think developed a passion for was the film and television industry. Mm -hmm. Somebody walked into our office one day, and and uh, she said. You know, I, I think it's about time that you know computers were really used on the business side of, of film and television. And we thought, wow, that sounds glamorous. We knew nothing about it, of <laughs> course. And and uh, and this was around 1979, 1980. And so we started developing software for film and television, uh, and mostly in financial applications for mm -hmm. that. And this was in Canada again. And at that time, we just caught this wave uh, where the film and television industry was really coming up in Canada. And uh, and then one thing led to another. And soon we were, you know, right across the country, bought, uh, bought some other companies to expand what we were doing. Uh, before I knew it, I was, you know, running a company of, of 100 employees and then uh, eventually uh, sold that company. Uh, How old were you at the time when you had 100 employees? Uh, I was in my 30s, um, uh -huh. and uh, you know I'm not sure exactly what age of my 30s I was, but I was in my 30s. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we eventually sold that company to a, a public company, and that public company was also involved in the film industry, but more in the uh, in the animation and visual effects side of, of the business. Uh, and then, so I went to run that public company. So I became the CEO of that company for, for some time. Wow. Yeah. So how did you learn to manage people? Because I would assume most people will learn that by going to school and you went to the school of life. You had a hard, hard knock university, the, the, the hardest one. 
And I would be very interested to know how did you develop management skills and how did you become a good leader by just doing the work? Uh, a lot of it really was the seat of my pants. I, I just had to learn as I was going along. A lot of it was by trial and error. I mean, there are so many things that I could have learned by, you know, by going to university and, and learn that much faster. But I had exposure and, you know, I had the day to day experience. And um, I think if you keep your eyes open and your I think com compassion is a really important quality and humility is another one and it, it, those those are things that don't necessarily come easily or naturally to to a lot of people and it's something that didn't really come naturally to me something <laughs> that i had to learn and i think i learned that through my own experience through the way that others treated me as well um and i think if you if you develop that compassion towards other people in other words if you're putting yourself in their situation you're seeing yourself as they are and what they need, what's going to be good for them, and you have a desire to help them succeed, um, that that does a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. That really speaks a lot for managing people. Um, and it, also, if you have humility, I think it's it's probably one of the most important qualities that you can you can manage as as a leader is humility. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of people think about that, but think of the converse of that. If you're not humble, it means you're saying to yourself, I've got nothing to learn from anybody else. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're demonstrating living a life of humility, it means you're open to other ideas. You're open to, to having people teach you the things that you may not know already. So it means that you're not, you know, you're not, necessarily born a savant you don't know everything about management you don't know everything about leading people you don't know everything about how they react about what their emotions are but if you're open to that and if you're humble enough to be able to absorb that and observe that and experience that and then as a result of it use it to change things for other people to create an environment for them where they feel where they feel seen you know, they feel seen and they feel appreciated. I think that's important. Yeah, that's very, very important. Um, I I was curious. So you you mentioned humility. So I would assume you had moments of arrogance or cockiness. Can you give us an example that you were too confident and it backfired on you like right away or after some time some employees were mad at you or there was some internal conflict because of your superior attitude for a while, possibly? How, how do you know me so well? <laughs> <laughs> the crystal ball, Mark. The crystal ball. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Oh man, I made I made lots of mistakes, and uh, I, I think I think as well. There's an evolution that is just natural for most people. You know, when you're in your twenties, you're you're very much on a learning curve, and that's a it's a pretty steep learning curve. When you're in your thirties, your thirties and your forties are a time where you're being very aggressive. You want to prove your stuff. You, you, you climb all over other people. Uh, you stab other people in the back because you want to get ahead and you think that's the way of doing it. You're arrogant as hell. And you know, if there's any time in your life that that's it, you know, it's in your thirties and forties. And, and you know, I, for a lot of the part, I was that guy. I mean, I think I had some innate qualities, hopefully of some humility and some compassion. But to me, um, success was really important and proving myself was very important and money was very important, uh, all those things. So in order to get that, I, you know, I had my moments where, yeah, I was, I was really arrogant and I, I, um, I needed to get slapped down a few times and needed to get, um, uh, to really learn some lessons in order to, uh, uh, so kind of wash that out of my system and, and prove to myself that there was something else that worked. Yeah. What was your lowest point in your career? Because now I, I see you had a good success, but I think people like and connect with the hardship. So I would be, yeah, very curious to know maybe one time that you felt rock bottom professionally wise, uh, doesn't have to be personally just in your career, or if it can be personally too, it can be a combination of both just a time that you had, man, 
this cannot get any worse. Where am I going? What am I doing? But there will there will be some silver lining eventually. Yeah, there. You know, there were times when when I thought uh, that we were really failing as a company, and and you. Uh, so you know, in the course of my career, I've been through a number of recessions, and. Recessions are, are typically very hard for a business to ride out. And when you're the leader of that company, you tend to associate yourself with the success of the company as well. And so there were times when, you know, when we hit very low points in the company and we had to lay people off. For me, that was one of the hardest things to do. Is here you've, you've nurtured these people, you've hired them, you've made a promise to them uh, that, that, you know, you're going to to give them a job, hopefully give them a career mm -hmm. and something that's going to improve their lives. And then you got to let them go. You know, that's really, really difficult. And mm -hmm. and you, you see that. And these people have become your friends sometimes. And uh, and it was it was very, very difficult. I and mean, so there were there were moments like that. And there are, are emotional moments in business as well that really have very little to do with the business. But you you de especially when you're a smaller company, you develop this family that works with you. And we had some people that were very close to us and, uh, you know, people who go through tragedies of their own or, uh, you know, and you, you, you ride that out with those people as well. Uh, it can be, you know, those can be the kind of emotional ups and downs mm -hmm. of, of just running a business. I think everything, every aspect of it, you take personally, both the successes and oh, Siri wants me. Uh, Siri wants featuring yeah, in the interview. Wants to get in on the conversation. Uh, yeah, you take you take it very personally, both the the highs and the lows. Mm. And was it difficult for you to separate between your employees' problem and your problems, or it was always like mixed because of this proximity, like this family vibe, as a, at the beginning? It's it's all it's always mixed, and especially especially when you're a smaller company. I think when once you get to a certain critical mass, that starts to change a little bit because you can't have a personal relationship with anybody. But when you're a smaller company, when you're you know 10, 20, 30 people, you know almost everybody that you know is is family. You know, some are yeah. like cousins that you don't see all that that often, but. You know, some of those people are, are really, really close. And so you do develop those personal relationships with them and, and you tend to, to live their lives with them. Mm, yeah. Um, you mentioned that you've been through a couple recessions and maybe economic depressions. How hard were you affected in 2008 uh, when the big crisis hit? Like, was it even, what were you doing at the time? And was it any... Any difficult situation, difficult decision to, to make, to take, or uh, how was it for you? Like a couple, how many years ago? Fourteen years ago. Well, in 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 two thousand eight, it's interesting that you ask him about that specific period because I had retired, so I I stepped down from the public company, and this is, you know, I hope an interesting story as well and an interesting lesson. I had this typical entrepreneurial thing where we're an entrepreneur builds his or her company, sells it to a public company, runs that public company and doesn't like it. And so, so, you know, you think in some ways that running a public company is going to be the pinnacle of your career. And for a lot of people, it is, I think, you know, becoming the CEO of a public company, that's a big deal in yeah. the world. Most people yeah. kind of reach the, the highest echelon. The apex predator. And, and now, you know, it wasn't a big deal public company it was a it was a very small public company but still yeah there there there's a certain profile that comes along mm -hmm. with that but what also comes along with it when you're an entrepreneur is a change in relationship it's a change in the way that people look at the business and especially your board of directors when you build a company as an entrepreneur you build it usually out of your passion it's something that it's an idea that you've you've loved or a process that you've loved and you're passionate about it and you put everything into it and you better put everything into it as an 
entrepreneur because you're probably not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. So, so you got your life in this, you got your emotion, you got your heart in it. You sell to a public company, not the same thing. You know, they don't, there's no passion there. There's no passion for what you do for the very core of your existence of what made you what you were, what a public company is passionate about is money. It's about the earnings. <laughs> Profit, it's, baby. It's, yeah, it's about the share price. And so when I sat down with my board of directors, it, it really was so little about the product unless that product was somehow going to, to jump up the share price, you know, mm. unless it was going to really improve earnings so that the share price would jump up. And, you know, the directors typically have a lot of shares themselves. So it's very important. They're very invested in the company. So that's what they want to see. They want to see that success. So it's, you can, you know, it's not in every case, you can, as an entrepreneur, sometimes manage to, to keep that and steer it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, going into a public company for the first time, I was a little naive uh, as the CEO of a new public company. And I, I had a lot to learn and it was just such a frustrating experience for me that, that after a while I just said, no, I'm just, I'm just going to leave. I'm going to retire. So I retired early. Uh, I actually retired when I was 50 and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm done. I've, I've made the money that I want to make and, mm -hmm. and that's it. And so during 2008, I was actually retired mm -hmm. and then, uh, recession came along. Um, you know, a really, really interesting time because you're looking at that as a, as a retired person rather than somebody who's in business. But I kept in touch with, with a company in, in Los Angeles who we used to do a lot of business with. And the CEO and I there uh, remained friends. And he called me up one rainy day in Vancouver. This is where we were at the time and, and said, how would you like to come and work for me? And he mentioned this a number of times before. He said, I want you to come down and be my COO. And uh, it was a business that I knew well uh, at the time. They had 1,200 employees. And, um, hmm. and I looked at the weather. It had been raining for 28 days straight. <laughs> yeah. And I said to, to my husband, ah, how would you feel about moving to Los Angeles? And we, we both went, hmm, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> and so, so, you know, sometimes, well, not just sometimes, always life puts these things in front of you, you know life really is a banquet and there are so many things to choose from and when when it's offering you this 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 banquet that's in front of you why not try it why not take advantage of it my life has always been an adventure with so many things that are in front of me that it's it's been fun to be able to to pursue those and you know my my idea my philosophy and fortunately my husband's as well is that you know it's an adventure and, and seize that, um, go for it because you never know what doors are going to open for you. And we thought, you know, if we go down to Los Angeles and, and the CEO of the company at the time, he said, if you hate it, go back after three months, six months that, you know, do whatever. So we, we thought, you know, how are we going to like living in Los Angeles and, uh, uh, going down to the States and, and, we ended up loving it and after six months we we turned around and we went wow i just can't believe how much we we love it here and how much we're enjoying it and fortunately the ceo that i was working with uh had the very same philosophy as me uh and and just about helping people to become successful that was his his main goal in just about everything that he did that was the mantra that he continued to go back to and so it was wonderful to be able to work with somebody like that. And so I did that for eight years uh, in Los Angeles. And then I finally kind of retired. I'm not very good at retiring. That's yeah. Do you, like, do you even believe in retirement like fully? Because in my perspective, retirement is when people, they lose passion for what they're, they're doing. And then they feel like, oh, I'm going to play a bit of golf. I'm going to travel a bit around the world, go to the beach. But this is eventually going to, to fade and become boring. And if you don't find something more important to your heart, then what will happen is probably you will either die or have symptoms. Or your body will tell you, Mark, do something. This is not fulfilling. Yeah. I need to move. I need to 
help to serve the humanity. So I, I think you're already a good example. You're 65, if I remember. Yeah. And this, you don't look 65. Everybody will agree with that. So I'm giving you this, this uh, <laughs> anti-aging <laughs> plug. Um, and you still have so many projects. It's like you have still maybe one third of your life to come if you live to 100, which I hope you will do. If you hope, if you, I think it's like you have so much more potential, but you already have so much background. So do you believe in real retirement? Well, I think so much of that depends. I, you know, changing jobs. Yeah, there's there is. Um... Hmm. There are a couple things that play into that. I think your 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 batteries run down after a while. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're you're not as quick as you used to be. You you don't have the recall that you used to be. Things don't come as easily as as maybe they once did. But there's also so that's that's an internal thing. Uh, I'd like to think that I'm you know I'm still sharp. I can still do a lot of stuff. Uh, that I can still add value to things and. You know, as you mentioned, I, I sit on a few boards here and there. I think I do add value that way. That's that's mm -hmm. been really, really great. Um, but if you get to a point in your career where you're not having fun anymore, uh, and I, I think where you're not stimulated anymore, you stop adding value. And when you stop adding value, I think it's really important for you to recognize that. Or maybe not that you've stopped adding value, but you've stopped being passionate about adding value. I mean, that's the important thing mm. is that, is that, yeah, you can do your job, but you're sleepwalking through your job or, or it's just not fun because of the people that you're working with or, you know, whatever the things happen to be, or you don't agree with the company or philosophy anymore, whatever it is. Yeah. Maybe that's time to move on. I've either move on to another job or maybe it's time to retire if you're, if you're able to. But I think when you do retire, it's so important to still be able to have purpose. You know, some people are wired that way that they can they can actually go play golf and tennis mm -hmm. and do that all day long and just have a community of friends and that's fantastic. Power mm -hmm. to them, you know. I got a got to love them for doing that. I'm I'm not really wired that way. I I like to be stimulated. I like to be challenged. I like to to know that I can, I can look forward to whatever the new chapter is going to be. I yeah. don't know what it is. I don't know what it holds, but I know that when I turn the page, somehow there's going to be a whole new thing there for me. And, and that's, that's great, great fun. And I never want to lose that. I really hope that mm. I will. Mm. That's beautiful. How would you say, so how can you help people who maybe they're in a life transition now, they're employees, they're bored, exactly what, as you mentioned right now, they, they're sleeping through life or they wake up and like, is that it? Just going to the coffee machine and it's another day, just groundhog day. How can you help them find what is truly meaningful to them and start taking action on that? Even if they don't quit their job right away, it can be a transition plan like over yeah. a year. But how, how would you say some tips maybe to just start connecting with your bigger why, your big purpose? And take small actions every day to make it real. Uh, to make it real, I think it's really important to stop and take stock. Um, people get caught up in in their jobs, and that's the only thing that there is for them in life. And um, it's it's very difficult for us right now. It's becoming, I think, increasingly difficult. It has been over the last, you know, 15, 20 years, where we're so wired and we have so many distractions in their lives right now. I think if, if you can take the time to, to stop and sit and contemplate your life a little bit differently, and that's a very scary proposition to some people. Um, you know, some people don't want to do that. They, they want to be distracted all the time or they want to work their asses off because they're afraid of what else might be out there or that there's nothing out there that's waiting for them that interest them otherwise. So I, I think it's really important to develop a uh, different kind of interests, you know, whatever they may be. Um, I think it's really important to, to volunteer, to, to get involved in your community and, um, to be able to, to, to give back in that way, because that opens up a whole new life for you. It opens up a different aspect of who you are. You know, it, it also, you know, hopefully, if it's something that you're passionate about, it opens your heart a little bit more mm. as well. 
Um, and a lot of us don't really think about that. But additionally, I think it also opens a pathway to something else when, when you do eventually retire. Yeah. Can you please tell us more about your experience with the, um, in the prison with the cellmates? Because I think this, I know that so people don't know about this, but you volunteered and you, you help the inmates find meaning, I guess. Yeah. To find them, like find something that they like or how to get back in society and how to become better humans. So this is something that may be scary for most people. And you seem to be quite fearless and courageous in that aspect. How did you enter in this opportunity and what did you learn out of it? Uh, it, it ties into, um, it ties into my, my own personal practice. Really. I, I've, uh, I've meditated for many, many years for decades. In fact, it was something that I started a long, long time ago. And, um, when mindfulness started to become a, a little more known, a little more popular, and I was reaching an age where I was thinking about retiring, I thought, you know, mindfulness would be, would be really interesting for me to, to teach people in a business type environment. Uh, and so mindfulness combined with meditation. So I actually started doing that, started studying that and, and actually did some courses in, in being able to teach mindfulness. And for a while, uh, after I did retire, I taught mindfulness to business organizations, uh, across, across North America. Um, a friend of mine who I had done the mindfulness courses with, uh, she went off and she volunteered at a prison one day. And I can't remember exactly how, how she came to do that, but she called me up and she was just so excited. And she said, Mark, I've, I've just come back from this prison. I've been there twice now, volunteered teaching them mindfulness and meditation mm. prisoners. So you got to do this. You got to look into this because it's amazing. Uh, and so I thought, well, I trust her. Um, I'll go off and do that. And so I, I found an organization. I volunteered with this, this Buddhist monk, uh, who actually taught mindfulness and meditation in prisons. And, uh, fortunately I had a, a long background in Buddhism as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, so off we went to, to prison and you know what she, my friend was absolutely right. And when I got out of there, I thought this was just such an amazing day. And we went to four different, uh, four different, they're called yards in the prisons. And these are maximum security, uh, prisons in California where it's crazy. You know, your first experience of going into prison where you go through these walls and then you go through barbed wire and then you go through chain link fence and you've got all these doors slamming behind you and guards with, with keys that are this big, you know, mm. and dangling from their, from their belt loops and stuff. And, uh, you know, everything is locked up and you are left in a room with, you know, anywhere from, you know, six to 28 prisoners uh, alone, completely alone. And these guys have committed the worst type of crimes that you can think of through murder, uh, you know, all sorts of things. They're, they're tatted from, from head to toe, you know, they're scary looking guys. And, you know, when, when you, and it was all, all guys, the prisons I volunteered in, when you first go in there, it's a, it's kind of a frightening, it's a very overwhelming experience. And the only thing that you've got to protect you is this little buzzer that they give you that if something goes wrong, you press the buzzer and lights and sirens go off and the guards come rushing in. But otherwise you are locked, like literally locked in a room with, you know, 28 guys who have committed the worst types of crimes. It is, you know, for me, one of the most amazing moving experiences that I've ever had. And, and I think part of that is because they are so grateful that you're coming out there and you're spending the time, you're dedicating some of your time to them and helping them. Um, and you know, what we were doing is giving them, it's not, not 
trying to indoctrinate them into Buddhism or any other religion, but just to give them the tools of meditation and mindfulness to look at their words, worlds a little differently and to develop a much more peaceful attitude towards themselves and towards one another. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do in prison. You know, when you're in prison, you're constantly exposed to to distractions, to noise, to doors slamming, to people yelling, to it's horrible. And you know, to be able to to retreat to an interior and find some peace, but not just find some peace, also find some compassion for other people. Uh, it's a pretty pretty amazing experience, and it's a very deep experience. And so for them to, to be able to, to get that from us, for us to be able to convey that to them, they're just enormously appreciative of, of it. And so every day that I left, I had a smile on my face. Mm. I, I learned more from them sometimes, I think, than they ever learned from me. Uh, it was an, an incredible experience. Um, the wisdom of some of these prisoners is just so profound you wouldn't think that at all uh, but they've got time to think they've got time to yeah. reflect and hopefully if they're spending time in prison that's one of the things that they're doing that's why they're there they're not all going to be like that some of them are just you know learning how to be bet better gang members but some of them actually mm -hmm. do take the time and they do they do learn a lot do you remember maybe one wisdom nugget that somebody told you that maybe you still remember today and it's like oh man that was so powerful when you said that like a couple of years ago yeah um the, you know there there were there were many and you know they would call me on on things sometimes you know some of the things that i said or some of the 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 reactions that i had but i think I, you know this isn't necessarily one of the wisdom nuggets but it was one of the the most uh, astounding moments I think that I, I had in teaching. It was it was during the time of the massacre in, in uh, Las Vegas when that gunman from a hotel room shot over 50 people, killed over 50 people. And I thought, you know, let's, so the, the format of the class was always we'd do, we'd talk, we'd download a little bit first, then we'd do this meditation that would last from 20 minutes to half an hour. And then we'd have a group discussion afterwards. So in the group discussion, I had about 24 people, I think, in the class at the time. And uh, we talked about, I thought, well, let's use this moment as a, as a teaching moment, maybe for uh, the Vegas thing. You know, so it was going out on a limb a little bit. And it's always, it's a little dangerous territory. But I said, you know, you, you've heard about this, obviously. You know, how do you, how do you feel about it? You know, tell me, what are your feelings towards the... The, the guy who killed them. And, you know, th these are, uh, most of these guys have, have murdered. I, so most of them actually had committed murder, the guys that were in, in the class. I would say about 80, 85% of them. And almost every single one of them said, oh, he's, he's an ass, he's, you know, he's evil. He, you know, how could he possibly do that? How could he go out and kill that many people? And and I said, you know, I'm thinking this is interesting coming from people who have actually committed murder themselves. Mm. Um, and I said, okay, well, well, right, well, that's fine. So maybe that's reflective of what you've what you've learned, or how you feel about yourselves now. And that's a great way to go back to the world. And I said, but tell me about this guy. I said, is there any room in your your hearts or mind for compassion for this guy? And you, everybody paused and you see the lights go on and one of them goes, well, well, wait a minute. If we feel like he's so bad and we have no room for compassion or understanding of what he's done, how are people going to look at us? Mm. And it was just this dead silence around the room. Whoa. Like the lights went on and, and all of a sudden they went, oh my God. You know, we have to look at other people a little bit differently than we look at ourselves. We have to find room in our hearts for compassion uh, for other people as well. And it was just an amazing, amazing moment. Um, so, so there's, you know, 
there's wisdom there that just lives below the surface, I think, mm. in one of us, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Uh, and there are lessons to be learned from even the most awful things that you may have done. And there's some, some peace and understanding that lives just under the surface of that. So that, you know, that was probably one of the most amazing moments. And yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. Do you think it's easier to get to such level of wisdom as an individual or as a group? Hmm. Good question. I think it depends on the group, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, because if if you're if you're in a group that um, you know it's not a good influence on you, you're you're probably not going to learn a lot, or you're going to learn the wrong things. So often, if there's somebody who can help you, if there's a leader who is wise and who can uh, who can help lead you uh, to certain conclusions that you then draw out of yourself. I think that's the best of situations mm -hmm. because I think there's that, that symbiosis as well of, of a good leader and of what you know yourself. You can't, you know, no one uh, is perfect. No one is absolutely enlightened uh, all the time. And you can't look to somebody to to be your salvation or to be the constant source of wisdom for you that you know look at them as some sort of uh you know religious saint who is who is never going to be wrong well it's not true we're all wrong um i think we all have our moments of clarity and enlightenment and we all have our moments of 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 darkness as yeah. well and so, so, but if there's that combination, that symbiosis of, of someone who maybe has walked that path before and who has seen things and now sees things a little bit differently and with a little bit more clarity, that maybe can help you pull it out of yourself as well. I think that's the best combination. Mm. And, so, and if people have never done meditation before and they want to start and just listen to their intuition, their, their soul, their inner self, do you have any good tips or maybe resources or books that you think are good to just begin when you have just you're used to watching TV or you're used to social media, constant stimulation, and you just want to find inner peace to listen to yourself to make better decisions? How can we get started? I think the best tip is that, you know, a lot of people think that meditation is going to to just shut down your mind, to shut off all sorts of thoughts and to to find some sort of uh, uh, complete silence uh, and, and complete peace and bliss and to be able to live in a state of that. And it's not true. It, it doesn't work that way. And I think that is the most important lesson of mindfulness and meditation that you can take away because it's the way your mind works. It's the way we're wired. We're, we're wired as humans to think. We're wired as humans to solve problems. And those things come up all the time. So in meditation, I think the most important thing is to know that those thoughts are going to arise, even when you're sitting and when you're trying to be quiet. The, the, the simplest form of meditation is to concentrate on your breath, to think about your in-breath, your out-breath, and only about that. Just thinking about breathing in, I feel myself breathing in, breathing out, I feel myself breathing out. And and just keep on trying to concentrate on that. And when a thought comes along, just acknowledge it and say, oh, it's a thought. You know, I got distracted for a minute. Going to go back to my breath. And knowing that that's going to happen to you a thousand times within, you know, 50 minutes. <laughs> and you're going to get distracted. But knowing that you're distracted and acknowledging that you've had that thought and then getting back to your breathing, that's what meditation is. It's not about this constant state of bliss for 15 minutes, because if you've got that expectation, you're going to fail. Mm. It's about acknowledging that thoughts are going to come and going, oh, that's interesting. I'll get back to you and then go back to my breathing right now. Mm. Keep on coming back. And what it trains you to do is it trains you to look at your mind a little bit differently. It trains you to look at your thought because it you're becoming detached from the way that you're thinking and you're going, well, oh, this is just a mechanical process that's going on. This is something 
uh, that I don't have to be ruled by, that I don't have to be controlled by. You know? uh, I can look at myself and look at my, my thoughts a little bit differently. And that's ultimately, I think, what meditation and mindfulness is training you to do. Do you think it's something that is lacking in the corporate world, uh, especially in the C-suite employees or just owners? Like, could they learn more to do that so they can be better leaders and more present? Or it's already maybe you work with such people already and it, it's quite already known. Do you see any progression on that in the last few years? I think or it decade? depends on the corporate philosophy because I yeah. think that there are there are companies who that very thought is anathema to them. So you take uh, most of the companies, uh, the social media companies, for instance, uh, they would rather you not think of that. They, they want you to be distracted. You know, mm -hmm. they, they want you to go to the next thing that's, that's on your iPhone or, you know, on your laptop or whatever. It, it's, you know, mindfulness is not something that really is part of their corporate fiber. It, it can't be. You know, they may individually, as as corporate leaders, think that they need that. They need to to be more focused and more concentrated and more peaceful. And and uh, so, yeah, I think it's something that we can only use. Uh, I think for everybody, it's it's a very important thing to do because there's. I believe that it's only there that you start to connect with the world around you. Uh, with the in, interrelationship that we we all have with everything, you know, with plants, with animals, with the air, with with everything, and I don't I don't think you're capable of doing that unless you you sit and you focus and you let those distractions drop away. It's only then that you start to to really um, to really connect. Yeah, connect with the world, with as animals, plants, everything. Are you a big fan of physical activity and or just going for a walk to clear your mind? How do you uh, take care of yourself physically? Yeah, I, um, I used to run uh, a lot. I used to run distance. And mm -hmm. uh, and for me, that was one of the greatest things. I, I had to stop because I got hit by a car when I was running. Oh, so, so uh, <laughs> okay. uh, that kind of put an end to my distance running career. But I, I still, I still work out. I still do a lot of physical activity. To me, that's really, really important. So, you know, every day I get something in, I, or I go to the gym every other day, or something like that. I, it's just, it's very important. And, and yeah, I find uh, as a way of clearing my mind, I find the, uh, you know, going on walks or something. So I write a lot now. Um, everything from essays to to novels to screenplays to all sorts of things and and i find that sometimes when i'm stuck the best way of, of clearing my head or of just shifting gears like literally shifting gears is to go out for a walk and i'll start thinking about things a little bit differently and it, it's helpful i had the same exact comment with one of my guests this week so it's it's funny when i see connection between my guests who have good great wisdom and I hope people, my audience can listen to that and realize if you're used to be always home, always on the computer, always on the phone, the power of going out for a walk and just get this creative juice going because your body is meant to move. And if you don't let it move, it's like dry rot on a car. It, yeah. it has to be used eventually or you have problems and it's just not physically, it's mentally too. Somebody can be way more depressed and anxious and I'm not a doctor or psychologist but during pandemic the crisis of like a mental health crisis at home because people were just stuck and feeling imprisoned and being always with the family 24 7 which is can which can be difficult for some people and easy for, for other people but there's something about being stuck in four walls and not seeing the horizon and not seeing the mountains and the lakes it's not our dna and you know i'm working from home so i'm a good example of that and some days when i'm like I feel very crabby. I feel just eh, something, just open the door, go somewhere and yeah. come back when you feel better. Yeah. You know, even going, if you've got a park that's nearby, being in nature, just being is sitting on a, on a, on a bench or sitting on the grass and being surrounded by, by trees and, and nature. It's just 
so helpful, even if you're in, in an urban environment. Like we have a park here in Montreal that's just two blocks away. And, you know, St. Laurent goes up, up one side of the street and yeah, St. Joseph goes down the other side of the park and it's busy, but you're in that little park and you're surrounded by trees and you're surrounded by people who are really appreciating where mm -hmm. they are in the middle of their environment. It just makes a difference. It changes your mindset for a minute. Uh, and I, yeah, I just think it's really healthy. Yeah. Um, what was my, ah, uh, so now we're getting, um, I would like to speak about, so you have many, many houses in many different countries. And I think there's something interesting in that. Like, how can you tell us, okay, you have Montreal, California, and Mexico. Why is it important for you to have a multi-country lifestyle compared to just being stuck in one city? Uh, I think there's something about international mindset we can discuss for a couple of minutes. <laughs> well, some people would just say that we're crazy. <laughs> uh, fortunately, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm married to someone who, who has a real sense of adventure as well. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so the U S just happened because, uh, so I, I'm, we were born in Canada and the U S just happened because the job came along and then we took it. We really liked it. We, we actually, uh, took out our, our U S citizenships, uh, as well, um, for a number of different reasons. Um, so we're Canadian and U S citizens now, but, uh, so growing up in Latin America, uh, growing up in Brazil and Puerto Rico before that. I've always been drawn to, to that culture uh, as well. And uh, I learned Spanish when I, when I was a kid. And, and Luke, uh, my husband, uh, started learning Spanish before I met him, you know, almost 30 years ago. Uh, so so we, we were just kind of drawn to that. And uh, always loved Mexico and, and Latin America and, and went down to, a place called San Miguel de Allende. It's up in the hills, north of Mexico City. It was this little colonial town and we just absolutely were enchanted by it. I mean, almost from the minute that we set foot in that place, we were enchanted by it. It's not on the water, it's, you know, it's it's really up in the hills and uh, just, just an amazing little place. And uh, we thought, you know, maybe as in investment, you know, we're trying to convince ourselves of this, right? And, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing to do. And we can rent out the house. A lot of people do that. And, and, and then we just thought, well, this is, you know, this is that opening up the book and turning the page to the next chapter thing again. It's a, for us, it's really about staying stimulated and staying challenged. So what does that mean to us? Well, it means that we have to, so we go down there and we live there for, you know, three, four, five months in a row. And it means for us that we have to live in the center of a different culture. We have to learn a different language or, or improve in a different language because, you know, we're not absolutely fluent in the language. Um, we have to learn how to operate a little bit differently. And uh, that's a challenge to me. And, you know, I, it's so important for us to keep on doing that, to keep on being stimulated and to keep on being challenged uh, because that's what's to me what life is all about. Because the minute that you stop that, the minute that you don't want that anymore, is probably the minute that your batteries are going to die completely. Mm. And uh, uh, so, so for us living in the different places um, uh, just means that it means that we're, we're, exposed to, to different things, to different ways of life, to different things that we can do. So even in, in Mexico, I mean, we're going to look for, this is a pretty new thing for us, but we're going to look for opportunities to volunteer there mm -hmm. and um, to get more involved in the community there. Uh, we do that here when we're in Canada. We do that when we're in the States as well. So it's, it's just one of those things that, that kind of happen. But it's it's fun. We have this very nomadic lifestyle. We move yeah. all around. We spend more of our time, I think, in Montreal now than any, anywhere else. Uh, and you know, Montreal, same thing. When I when I come here, and you know this well. I mean, I, I study French, and and man, that's a real challenge for me. <laughs> Fortunately, you've been able to help me out with that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but uh, but just to be able to immerse yourself in somewhere that's completely different that's important to us so you you would say to people listening to that so if you have the chance to go somewhere new and let yourself go in this new environment and even if it's scary to just embrace the new lifestyle and figure it out because even if you don't have all the, the answers you will become such a better person by trying stuff and falling on your face and like for me with georgia it, it was the same i came here with zero money zero language like i didn't have utensils and sheets for my bed my wife just gave me some such of these things when i came here so but i had to realize i still have my my wisdom i still have my heart uh i can i can figure something out it will take some time so would you recommend people who can do it who maybe don't have such big family commitment maybe they're single and they're young and just go for it go to mexico go to uh, any country in europe go in china and and see how you will be by yourself absolutely I, you know i think if you've got if you've got the means and you know it's not going to hurt anybody else you know for you to go i think it's one of the greatest learning experiences that you can have there's a there's a whole school of life out there that you know is just begging for you to partake and mm. um and it is scary you know like you know look at you moving to georgia absolutely you know what did you know about it you know going in there Nothing. in the first place but <laughs> man you know what did you learn and and Everything. how much did you grow as a result of that it's it's huge uh and yeah i would recommend doing it especially while you're young uh expose yourself because it will change the way that you look at the world it'll change the way that you you look at other cultures as well you'll just learn a whole lot more yeah i also think you become more appreciative of who you are because you can know more your own values and you can judge less other religions and, and culture as you said so i came here it's very orthodox and in quebec it's catholic but we don't really care about religion so to be able to come here and start to love people who are more religious and very like they have big faith and to not judge it like it's their belief i respect that and i came to love that as they are and to realize religion is really just about love if you can see the the depth of it um okay there's some fear-based stuff and cults and all that stuff but if you go back to people who are just practicing their spirituality in true their god they're praying for better life for health for their loved one for business for uh, peace and connection so basically it's all the same root or the same connection of all religions so i came here with this new perspective like okay people are more conservative here but i'm not going to judge that and now i can appreciate even more and it, it keeps your brain your mind way more stable than being in black or white oh these are too conservative or these people are there they're doing this and it, this big judgment it's it's just so draining yeah. compared to being able to embrace all the uh the eco the environment of multiple spiritual beliefs in my opinion yeah yeah absolutely that um that understanding i think is something that, that comes in time and it takes uh it, it takes a, a a certain amount of, of shedding that protective layer that we walk around with sometimes because you know the protective layer is often our culture it's what we were we were born with or what we grew up with anyway it's a learned behavior and and we use it as a shield um uh and as a result we we tend to look at everybody else as the other or why don't they understand us or why don't they do things the way that we do and when you're not exposed to a lot of different cultures or a lot of different ways of thinking it's what you automatically resort to because it's your safe place it's what you know you're familiar with it and you know you, you have a certain amount of security by believing in that um uh, letting go of that can be difficult you know and i think it's important to chip away at that at that armor yeah and i know your parents were really religious at the, at the time um was it difficult for you to break out of the mold of what they wanted you to become and just accept that you would be on a different path yeah, absolutely yeah yeah it was uh you know my parents were real fundamentalist christians and and uh very very 
strict beliefs. They expected us to be a certain way. My father was, you know, a big elder in the congregation. This goes back for generations in my family on both sides of the family. And uh, yeah, it took a it took a long time to for me to realize that uh, this this wasn't my way, wasn't my path. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it took took a long time to for me to separate from that. I mean, it was a gradual process. I did it kind of bit by bit, uh, and um, yeah, it took some time, but yeah. but it was gratifying. And I'm you know I'm grateful for the way that I grew up. I mean, that experience of uh, being in Latin America, being in Brazil and Puerto Rico when I was a kid, I, I wouldn't give that up for the world. It was it was difficult in some ways uh, because it was challenging, kind of dealing with who I thought I was, and and holding that up against the religion. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it also made me who I am. And, you know, I'm 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 happy with who I am. Mark. We are coming close to the end of the show now. And my last question for you would be, if we go in the future, five years from now, it's 2027, and people will go back at your episode and they will listen to you, I would like you to share what is your maybe one thing or your life message that you can give them, something very valuable that represents who you are and you want to be remembered for. I know it's a big question. I should have told you before. My mistake. <laughs> But no expectations, just go with the flow, but something that will pass the test of time, no matter how the technology will change over the next five years. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, if I, if I could, if I could teach anybody something, what I have, I've learned is, I mean, there are so many lessons, you know, the, the number one thing is that I'm not perfect and I would, I, uh, and nor is there any expectation of anybody that I ever would have been. But, but the thing is, I always thought that I, sh I should be, uh, that that's the way that I should grow up because that's what I was taught to be. I mean, there was a certain expectation of, of almost perfection in order to inherit, you know, God's kingdom. I mean, that, that was really the way that I was growing up. And that was, that was, it just, pounded into me in almost a cult-like uh, mm -hmm. fashion. And so I grew up being very hard on myself in, with that ideal of perfection, uh, that that's what I had to be. And it took me a really, really long time to let go of that, to realize that I'm not and I never will be. And so, so how do I live with that? You know, what do I do uh, in order to, you know, to, to fill that, you know, to feel fulfilled and to feel uh, like I'm accomplishing some sort of mission. Uh, and, and to me, it, it's about, it really is about compassion. Um, it's about being able to look at somebody else, acknowledge their situation and, and, you know, almost putting myself in their shoes and living it with them to the point that I want to, to help them. Uh, to to help them succeed, to help them to get better, to help them know that their lives also are not going to be perfect, but they can be better. They can be more peaceful, um, and they they can be more fulfilled. So hopefully that I can I can do that. And if I you know if I would like to to be known at some point for anything, it's just for being kind. You know, really just, just for being kind. Mark, thank you so much for this beautiful message. How can but, people... By the way, I, yeah. I, some people would say I, I got a long way to go. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we all do. Uh, yeah, but, of course. Yeah, I didn't Kindness. Rocky, and... But I just wanted to add that because, you know, it's, it's just so much about not that you're not perfect. It's what you strive to do mm -hmm. that makes you better. Yeah, lovely, lovely. How can people connect with you if they want to know more about uh, either your work, maybe your foundation? I know you have a big uh, involvement in some nonprofits, so maybe people want to, to follow you or to listen to you. How can we connect with you in the best way? And uh, yeah, just to say thank you maybe for this episode. 
Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, they uh, there's there, man. I don't know. I'm you know. I'm just. I'm not uh, big on social media. You're not the I, influencer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't Follow Mark I go on Facebook. I go to Instagram very occasionally. Rarely go to TikTok. Yeah. I'm, I'm just not good at that. But that's one of the things about distraction. I just don't try not to allow myself to be too too distracted. I am on Twitter uh linkedin again not that much but uh, uh and i don't have a website i should probably get one one of these days but, but uh but yeah or through you they can reach out to me as well yeah and linkedin i think also you you're active yeah linkedin, LinkedIn. Uh, absolutely yeah. LinkedIn. that could be the only professional one that is not a distraction yeah that you can use yeah, yeah. awesome yeah. thank you mark all so right. for me, guys, um, this is Anthony Rebeff for Your Brother's Podcast. You can follow me personally at my name on Instagram, Facebook. Um, YouTube will be uh, with Your Brother's Podcast channel already. Uh, I'm working on that right now. So if you feel inspired to, to help, you can like, subscribe, share with your friends. And if you want to support me financially for the, for the project, I will have a, a Patreon link in the description. Feel free to help us out to uh, raise the standards of this show. So thank you so much, Mark. And I will say to everybody, thank you for your, for your time and see you next episode. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.